All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, this is another episode of a Real World Serverless Podcast, and today I'm joined by Waldemar Hammer, who is the CTO of a Local Stack. Um, hey, man, welcome back. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be back. Um, I think we had one uh, a session a couple of months ago. It was really a pleasure, and it's, it's great to be here on the show with you today. Yeah, we did. Uh, actually, yeah, I forgot that it wasn't a podcast. It was a webinar at the time, uh, and uh, that was, I think, uh, after um, Local Stack version two came out, uh, and uh, you show uh, this, you showed me some of the new things that's uh, been inc uh, incorporated into Local Stack two, and I'm sure people that are listening to this podcast are probably familiar with Local Stack already. Um, it's been the, you know, you guys has been uh, around the block for quite a while, and I've used it, uh, I guess, way back maybe six years ago, uh, back when it was, uh, I think, still version one or before that even. And you guys have come a really long way uh, since those days. Um, and the, what you showed me in the version two, I think has been uh, was, was quite impressive. Uh, the fact that you support a lot of the IEM stuff nowadays as well, uh, and also much uh, broader support of the APIs. Uh, um, but then not long after we spoke last time, uh, <laughs> local stack version three came out. Uh, so I wanted to bring you back and uh, do another session with you and uh, see what's changed in the version three and maybe get you to maybe demo some of the things that uh, you can do in version three and how that's, I guess, uh, how that changes to your workflow as a serverless developer, um, you know, in terms of the things you can do locally nowadays. Uh, yeah, so before getting to it, I uh, want to just uh, quickly introduce yourself. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks for setting the stage. So my name is Waldemar, CTO and co-founder here at Locustack. Um, been with the project basically from the early days uh, when it started as an open source project back in uh, 2017, around that time frame. So it might have been the time when you were you know, last using some of the, the very early versions. We were uh, a long time ago, we were actually, um, um, you know, uh, zero ver, like not even like in version 1.0, but then... Um, around two and a half years, three years ago, we actually started building a team, a company around local stack. And now we have a, a pretty, it's an innovation engine. There's a lot of cool new things coming out and um, very, very excited to share some, some of the up updates uh, today. Yeah, it definitely felt like it was a pre version one because uh, it was far less uh, stable compared to today. And I remember uh, we had problems where uh, it would just break and uh, for no reason. And uh, we would spend you know, a couple of days just trying to figure out uh, what's going on. And it always uh, results in just someone have to just restart from scratch, just uninstall and uh, start from scratch again. Um, and uh, nowadays, uh, it feels much more stable. And uh, from what you showed me as well, it, there's also much more, I guess, much complete, more, much more complete support of the different services and APIs. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, again, if I just look back at five, six years in the past, I mean, back then we like. The local stack startup took like 10, 15 seconds because we were, you know, everything was really slow back in the days. And today we have a much faster plugin loading where all the code basically gets gets loaded asynchronously or lazily, basically whenever uh, it's requested first time. So there's lots of um, performance enhancement that we're building into the into into the, uh, the platform on an ongoing basis. We also con constantly add new service providers, especially in the AWS space. So we'll show uh, today also, for example, um, Step Functions recently released a completely new rewrite of the uh, of the service provider, uh, which results in a hugely optimized and, and and better performance and more lightweight image size also of the of the local stack image. Um, so yeah, definitely excited to to dive in into the more into the detail. And uh, just a note for anyone who's listening on the Spotify or any of the podcast platforms, uh, we're going to be showing a lot of demos uh, in this particular episode. So uh, it would be really much be, be much better for you if you were if you just jump to YouTube and use the link below and uh, watch the YouTube recording instead. Um, and uh, Volma, you said that you prepare some slides as well, some demos. So um, do you want to bring up your screen so we can have a look and see uh, what talking points you have prepared for us? Yeah, perfect. Absolutely. Let me go ahead and share my screen here um, and then we can show a couple of demos um, as usual. Hopefully the demo gods are going to be with us, but uh, <laughs> we'll see about that. Uh, so yeah, super excited to to share a couple of updates. And as usual, Jan, please feel free to you know jump in anytime. Obviously, this is more conversational, but uh, I'll have some slides to, to share and then we can dive into different topics. Um, so V3 um, uh, was released a couple of months ago um, and it really adds sort of a, a new milestone to, to our journey. So if you look back at sort of the early days of local stack, which we already discussed, you know, it was, um, it was you know, 
the, the product started to be pretty successful in the open source uh, over, uh, especially the time frame 2018, 2020, 2021. But really, from a product feature perspective, it's, it's not you can't even compare to, to what local stack is today, right? So there's been almost like an exponential um, uh, development in, in new features and, and, and uh, functionality. So right now, um, basically, this last milestone we added was in November 2023, um, shortly uh, after after reinvent. Uh, and uh, actually shortly before reInvent. Um, and then we also had a booth at reInvent, which was a, a, great, uh, a great way to interact with the, with the community. Um, so, you know, I think some of the numbers here speak for themselves. So the community is certainly growing on GitHub. We have um, a growing number of Docker pools on a daily basis and also quite an active uh, Slack community that I work with on a daily basis. Okay, so the numbers are quite impressive, but, but looking at your timeline there, uh, version 1, uh, July 2022, version 2 is uh, March 2023, and version 3 came out in November 2023. So you now we're looking at a gap of maybe a major release, a major version release every six to seven months. Uh, so while that's quite impressive in terms of the you know, evolution of the platform, but also as a user, it feels quite... Um, uh, quite scary that uh, there's a new major version, which kind of says to me that there are breaking changes. And uh, that kind of sounds to me like, okay, if I'm going to be using local stack every six to seven months, I have to do some work myself to get to the newer version. Um, so I guess, uh, no, what are, are these, are these really breaking changes? Or are they really major version updates? Uh, and uh, what's the sort of upgrade path for someone who's right now using say version two? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, partially those are breaking changes, especially when we introduce entirely new service implementations, like for example, as I mentioned with um, uh, step functions, we have a completely new implementation. S3 provider has been uh, completely rewritten. Uh, Lambda, there has been a big push that was actually pre uh, version three, that was already in version two. Um, so for the most part, we try to keep the, the update path pretty seamless. Um, so there's obviously for each of the services, some configuration options. Um, in version three, there were some um, networking enhancements and changes um, that were also um, part of the, the breaking changes. So I guess the, there was quite a bit of churn in the code base uh, over the last, especially um, one and a half, two years, which kind of um, necessitated a bit like these, uh, these frequent major updates, um, major releases. But I agree with you. It's certainly something that will maybe stabilize a bit over time with, with less frequent uh, major, major releases that we're pushing out. Okay, sure. Okay, um, so no, with that, I mind to continue. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, that's a great, great point for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to to briefly show to showcase this here because it's really been uh, an absolute blast to to attend reInvent for the first time. You can see us here, uh, some of some of us at the booth, um, had a lot of fun showing demos to the to the community. Lots of great interactions with uh, you know customers, uh, users, AWS heroes, community builders. Um, so definitely. Um, find us there next time and it's been absolutely fantastic and thanks so much for, for all the feedback to everybody there. Um, so yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, V3 uh, and this part of the slide deck is actually also taken from, from, from our uh, 3.0 um, community events that, you, that we had back in, I believe, the December, which is highlighted a few of the, of the updates and then I also added a few uh, a new, uh, new slides towards the end. So we definitely had a lot of um, features and feedback around advanced features that enterprises are, are really needing right in their day-to-day -day, um, um, workflows. So things like chaos engineering, for example, is an area we invested quite quite a bit. I have a short demo on this afterwards. Being able to uh, inject errors, latencies into uh, into the stack and see how your application reacts to that. Um, a lot of work around IAM. We already briefly touched upon this, but we we actually further enhanced the IAM support and have a bunch of really uh, cool new features. Um, we go also a bit beyond local, so um, we have started um, experimenting with ephemeral cloud sandboxes, which is something that allows users to spin up a local stack hosted um, sandbox, if you will, that doesn't run on your local machine, but it runs in, in, a, in a hosted remote environment. And then obviously have lots of enhancements for the different uh, services in the core emulator. Um, you know, some of the services I already mentioned, but uh, more to follow soon. And then also we're increasingly adding new emulators and also extensions. Um, so I'm going to briefly touch upon if we have some time towards the end uh, around a, a new um, emulator that we put out there for Snowflake. Um, so we are also expanding into sort of the data, uh, the data landscape and data pipelines and how we can facilitate um, these pipelines locally and in CI. Okay, I think the last one is really, really interesting, and uh, I definitely see a, a space for the 
for something like this because uh, obviously people don't just use AWS. Um, to use AWS, uh, we have lots of other external services and those services are often really difficult to test. Uh, I almost feel like uh, I probably need something like local stack for those services more so than I do for AWS because I've kind of worked out how to do you know, testing uh, locally, but you know, talking to remote AWS services. But um, yeah, those are usually more difficult with third-party services that I'm using. So super interesting about uh, 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 about what you guys are doing in that space. Uh, but also tell us about um, you know, why you're going into the space for chaos engineering and uh, maybe some of the, if you've got something prepared already, then maybe we can see some of the examples of uh, what other sort of things you can sort of do with uh, with chaos engineering here. Yeah, hundred percent. I have a short sample prepared that we can look into uh, in, in just a second. Um, but basically, it's sort of expanding beyond the happy path testing that is kind of you know the, the, the plain vanilla type of testing that, that is happening you know on a daily basis. But then sometimes it can be helpful to sprinkle um, you know certain chaos over over your test integration tests, right? Because um, I mean, there's a certain class of, of um, failures that, that are just inherent to the services, like things like um, a, a throttling or rate limiting of a DynamoDB or Kinesis, for example. Those are really actually um, uh, sort of uh, functionalities provided by the services themselves. But there's also, in some cases, outages that are happening um, in AWS. It's, it's very infrequent. It's not happening frequently, but it's, it's good to be able to test something like an, an entire region goes down or, or maybe Lambda has some, some 500 errors and hiccups, right? Um, so those kind of situations are pretty easy for us to test. And we've seen, especially with larger uh, organizations doing disaster recovery exercises, um, that it becomes really useful to have this encoded as a repeatable case engineering test, um, test suite. Um, but yeah, more on that um, later, maybe it becomes... I think, uh, that's, I think that's super interesting uh, because um, I guess the, the complexity of orchestrating and... Uh, uh, and, and 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 the risk involved with uh, well and, and also doing a chaos a, a chaos experiment uh, safely has been one of the barriers of entry um, for you know companies that want to do chaos engineering. Um, I so, so, so we should also start by saying that the chaos engineering is not just about uh, you know uh, failure testing your your infrastructure. It's there's, there's multiple layers to you know chaos engineering. There's part of that is testing your infrastructure. Part of that is testing your human processes and your mm -hmm. uh, your playbook, your runbook. So whether or not you have the the processes and the people that are trained well enough to to handle those uh, failures. Uh, as well as your system's ability to automati automatic or automatically recover from these failures. So what we're talking about here is uh, chaos engineering applied to the, I guess, the, the, the system level, not the sort of the human uh, uh, wetware on top of that. Uh, but still, it's you know, this. If you can do a lot of chaos experiments before you even get into a real cloud environment, I can I can see that and how valuable that is. But I guess the the thing that I have uh, I guess you no know, slight concern about is that the, a lot of um, the reason why you want to do chaos engineering and uh, test your uh, failure cases if, you know, in a real uh, AWS environment is to because you know you're depending on behavior that are specific to the implementation of that cloud provider, and so if we are doing chaos experiments with local stack, are we not testing according to you know, the, the failure behaviors? Uh, specific to the implementation of local stack, as opposed, which can be different from the real AWS services. Uh, yeah, I agree. So first of all, to your first point, definitely we here we're focused on the the technical aspects, um, but I, I agree that also the human aspect is super interesting. Um, but that is a bit out of scope here. Also, um, this is anything around pre-production. I know that there's also a work uh, stream or a whole industry around uh, chaos engineering of runtime, like production systems, right? Here, we're really more concerned about the, the development cycle and testing. Um, maybe, again, I think we'll maybe become a bit more um, concrete and we can maybe talk about um, a specific sample once, once we get there. Because um, here, yeah. this is really focusing on certain functionality or errors that can actually happen in the real system as well and being able to um, architect your um, your application in a resilient way, and then also having testing around that um, to make sure that it actually um, behaves as, as expected. Okay, okay, sure. Uh, let's look into that uh, yeah. uh, later. Absolutely, cool. 
Um, yeah, so just um, moving ahead a bit. So uh, again, uh, what's new in, in V3? So uh, this is uh, actually a lot of details can also be found in the uh, in the GA announcement release block that we put out um, back again. It was in, in November. Uh, since then, we actually had uh, two more minor releases, uh, 3.1 and, and 3.20. Uh, and um, and yeah, so some of the, the details I'm, I'm sharing here also basically uh, you can read up more details on the on the announcement blog as well, which is a great read. Um, so there's been a couple of uh, updated emulators, uh, among them um, being S3. We, we essentially did a almost like complete rewrite, um, uh, a lot of like increased parity, a lot of performance enhancements, the way how we sort of handle. Uh, files um, uh, in so previously a lot of the files were basically just kept in memory and now we have like spool temporary files that flush to disk in regular intervals so it's much optimized for performance um, step functions as I mentioned we have a separate slide on that in uh, next uh, and also elastic cache there have been uh, a bunch of enhancements around uh, cluster mode and, and just better configuration of, uh, of of Redis clusters for example on the local machine um, those are actually just three highlights that we put out there. There's actually much, much more in the release, but but those are some of the the, the key ones that we explicitly highlighted also in the in the release notes. Um, so specifically, when it comes to to step functions, I think it's it's um, this has been really an, an interesting uh, journey and investment. So we previously used the um, the AWS provided step functions local uh, Java. Um, uh, uh, framework or, or, or library, uh, which you're probably familiar with. Um, and one of the, the issues we were hitting there is that um, the this, this, this zip file, these jar files were getting pretty big, right? So we, we actually had uh, in the last local stack version, we had um, version 109 of step functions, which already had 46 megabytes. That's still acceptable, right? Um, but we generally try to keep the image, uh, Docker image as slim as possible. Uh, and some of the latest app functions, local uh, versions have more than 440 megabytes. And this is really sort of was the um, the incentive for us to say, okay, no, this is simply getting out of hand here. We need to we need to do something about this. Um, and we basically wrote an entirely new provider from scratch um, in, in Python itself. Um, this is uh, currently around 4.6 megabytes. So it's basically uh, uh, almost like a 100 times uh, X um, sort of decrease in, in size. Um, it is an interesting implementation. So we're actually using an, an Antler parser generator. Um, we also like we defined a whole grammar for, for the states language, um, the, the Amazon states language, uh, and also contributed that grammar to um, actually the open source Antler repository. So big kudos to, to our team for, for putting it out there. Two of our team members have been very actively involved in this. And, and again, it's something we, we've developed out there in the open source um, and, and also the, the grammar is available. Um, so pretty excited about that. The other thing that this new provider gives us is it's very much future proof from a from the way we envision step functions um, debugging also in, in the future. So um, you know that we have the, the web user interface, right, where we have our resource browsers, which we'll take a look at in, in a second. Um, and part of our vision there is to really have a, a visual step function debugger that allows you to set you know things like breakpoints and so on on the local machine. Um, it is something that's partly already available in the AWS console, so we can take some, some inspiration from there, but we really see um, a lot of opportunity here to do a visual inspection of your of your step function workflows. And, you know, even, again, different testing scenarios where in, in certain steps or branches you can inject potentially even errors and things like that, right? Yeah, um, that's, that's one of the things that uh, I recently put out a blog post about uh, the comparing lamp, the putting workflows in the Lambda function versus putting them inside a step function. And one of the things that uh, you get with Lambda is that you can you know, put a breakpoint in your code. Uh, so for something that's more complicated, it's easy to step through it. And of course, if using step functions, so you, you know, if you're using a Lambda function as part of a state, uh, a task state, you can still put breakpoints, but only for that particular step as opposed to the entire uh, workflow. And that's something that a lot of people have asked for. And personally, I would love to be able to, and that's something that I think uh, you know, Step Functions is uh, missing right now, that uh, the ability to use uh, mocking natively without using Step Functions local, because they've got this new test state API, uh, which is great, but it doesn't, it doesn't quite give you the ability to do a uh, uh, mocking uh, that you, you, know, you had with um, Step Functions local. Super interesting. Yeah, no, that, that, that's great feedback. Um, and actually, I think I saw, I saw the, the, the blog post that you put out there uh, and also the, the LinkedIn post recently. Yeah, I think it's there's a lot of um, 
Step functions really has its place. We're also using it in our own um, backend infrastructure for you know keeping transactional workflows more um, different types. Like it's just great to as as an orchestration engine, and I think there's a lot of need for for testing these kind of um, uh, these kind of flows that are running in step functions. So yeah, very excited to maybe get your feedback and iterate on this uh, in, in in the upcoming releases and versions. Awesome, yeah, very cool. Um, so the, the other point we uh, just really briefly want to touch upon is, is our networking initiative. So we, um, generally speaking, local stack, the plain vanilla um, deployment is on, on Docker, on, on the local machine. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, like networking is one of the, the key points that has been um, maybe a bit tricky in the past. Uh, so we, we added a, a whole lot of different configuration options. So for configuring ports, um, Docker networks, um, you know, um, the way how hosts are being resolved between containers and so on. And what we're also increasingly seeing is that, that um, users are deploying local stack also in other environments. For example, Podman is, is becoming more and more interesting and important. Um, Kubernetes, a lot of larger orgs are, are you know, standardizing on Kubernetes as a, as a deployment platform, especially for the CI CD pipelines. So we, we had to do a bunch of unification of the whole networking stack and introduce abstractions to, to make things more, more cross compatible. Um, and one of the, the key ingredients here is that we have this canonical um, host name, local host, the local stack of clouds, which is actually a, a host name you can resolve publicly uh, in the public DNS. It has 127.0.0.1. There's also a uh, an SSL certificate that's valid for this for this name and, and, and subdomains. Um, but the thing is that um, within the new local stack environment, this host name resolves to different IP addresses depending on where the request is coming from, right? So our DNS server can, can basically um, observe the request, see where it's coming from, and then resolve, um, give different answers back to the to, to the client, basically, right? So to make sure that every from every context, you always can always call home, call back to the to the main local stack container, which is important for things like Lambda, um, ECS, where we have you know separate containers that need to talk back to the to the main APIs. Um, and we also uh, sort of streamlined and simplified a lot the the configuration options. There's now basically two main ones. One is local stack host, so that's basically the um, the, uh, the 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 host name we define where the client can contact local stack. And gateway listen is basically the the address or set of addresses where local stack um, basically um, binds uh, its network ports to, right? So this is more sort of the the runtime uh, initialization and local stack host is kind of the, the client configuration to to make sure that uh, you can actually talk to the right host. So again, and this is where sort of the the breaking changes with with the uh, 3.0 are coming in because um, a lot of the standardization around these two main environment variables uh, was. You know, meant that you know customers maybe had to uh, to redefine uh, their Docker Compose files or or, or custom scripts. Um, but yeah, things are now getting much more streamlined and easier for for users. Things work out of the box and just just work essentially uh, for the most part. Um, cool. Yeah. So then we also spent um, quite a bit of time in like a, a new desktop app experience. Um, we'll actually see. Uh, in just a few minutes, the our desktop, uh, sorry, the, the web application of local stack, and there is also a downloadable desktop version that is now available for the major uh, operating systems, and also, you know, a fully code signed version that's available in the respective marketplaces. Um, so again, something that we we see, um, even though the web version is also great, but some customers just prefer to have like a you know a downloadable version that you can can run on your on your desktop. Um, all right, so I guess I'm just um, gonna continue uh, talk, talking through these points here. Just feel free to chime in anytime. Um, we already briefly um, sort of um, mentioned the the parts in the on the core emulator sites that we um, uh, that was mentioning. We also have a bunch of uh, innovations happening on the platform side, our, our cloud offering, right? So one of them is, uh, as briefly mentioned before, ephemeral environments, which give you a way to preview application states and, and share the states, really having these, these sandbox environments of local stack. Um, and then we're also um, adding more functionality around just um, CI integrations, right? So if you run local stack builds in your CI pipelines, having telemetry and analytics uh, in terms of, okay, what is which APIs are being called? Are there any successes or failure responses? And just getting more debuggability and insights into into CI. And I think we partially covered that also in the last 
uh, webinar, if you remember, with Google Amigo, but we've sort mm -hmm. of we keep adding uh, more functionality here as well. On the platform yeah, it was stuff. pretty cool that uh, you were able to integrate Lumigo um, with your local environment, so you can just actually use the Lumigo to monitor and observe and uh, troubleshoot uh, your 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 problems that's happening on your local uh, simulator. Um, so tell me a bit more about uh, ephemeral environments because that is something that I do all the time and it's something that I actually teach a lot in my uh, courses and workshops. Uh, but you know, creating in, uh, ephemeral environments in the, uh, in the AWS. So how does your implementations kind of differ from that? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And, and um, I think the concept of ephemeral environments has really uh, picked up um, traction in the last couple of years in, in the industry. Um, I think there's several manifestations of that. So um, certainly in, in, a, in a real AWS environment, you would be, for example, if you spin up, if you have your stack defined as, for example, CloudFormation or Terraform, you could just spin up the entire stack, um, you know, maybe some lambdas, some, some containers, some, da some databases, run your tests and then basically tear everything down. And then it's basically, um, you know, your, your resources are cleaned up again. Um, in the context of local stack, um, an ephemeral environment specifically is a actually a, a hosted local stack environment, a hosted local stack instance that runs in a cloud VM, and we manage the, the deployment of these VMs, and then you get an endpoint URL that you can then interact with. Um, we'll also cover this uh, shortly in, in, in the demos. Um, and if you sort of take the idea further, um, you can almost say that almost every CI build uh, is, is, you know, also usually creating ephemeral environments or, or some sort of ephemeral state where you can run your tests if you have a very sort of um, uh, sophisticated automated test setup. But I think, again, in our more specific case, what we're referring to is these, these hosted sandbox um, instances that are running in a, in, in a cloud VM, which, which we'll, uh, I'll, sh I'll show in just a bit. Um, so what's your, what, how do you sort of um, approach and, and teach ephemeral environments? What's your recommendation there? Uh, so I tend to just you know, wait for tools like uh, server framework. There's a built-in sort of notion of a stage. So creating a new ephemeral environment is just going to be as simple as uh, serverless deploy, you know, dash S to give it a, a, a stage name. And that name could be you know, the name of your feature branch or what have you. And the same thing can be done with uh, SAM. The same thing can be done uh, with CDK. So you're basically just creating a, a copy of your stack. Um, depending on what you use, if you're using just you know serverless components like DynamoDB, Lambda, API Gateway, there's no uptime cost, then you can create as many of these resources or these environments technically uh, as you need uh, until you run into the resource limits. Uh, but when you're using server full resources that are charged by uptime, things like RDS and things like that, then the, it requires a little bit more of a, I guess, a workaround to actually share those instances just so that uh, you don't have hundreds of uh, copies of uh, RDS running around or charging you uptime. Um, there's also some stuff that you have to do around uh, you know, SSM parameters. So if you're using SSM parameters to share information between different uh, uh, stack. So the platform team will create some resources like VPC networking stuff, and then it will tell the application team, okay, here's VPC ID, here's the subnet ID, and so on. Uh, you can often, you see people often share those uh, SSM parameters. So rather than having to duplicate the SSM parameters for every single environment, you I can also just introduce a new variable uh, called SSM parameter name so that, uh, you know, I can say, here's my environment name called the feature um, local stack version three, uh, but then the, use the, the, the SSM environment name called the dev so that I will use the same uh, SSM parameters uh, from the dev, the main dev environment. So that's how I tend to do my uh, ephemeral environments uh, in AWS. Uh, so that way I can just bring up a new environment when I'm working on a feature, uh, I'll do all of my uh, deployments um, and the testing in that environment. And then when it's done, uh, when I create a PR, I will just uh, run delete and uh, destroy the environment. And I can use the same technique uh, during a CI/CD pipeline so that um, uh, when you have this, uh, uh, when you have this uh, like you know, commit that you've done, uh, it would run the tests and all of that in CI/CD pipeline against a temporary environment that's created just for that CI/CD run. That way, it doesn't pollute any of uh, your main environments with test data, uh, and that's something that I think a lot of companies have so run into problems. Uh, so they end up writing a script that 
just clean the environment every month or so, and I've seen that a lot. So using ephemeral environments for this kind of uh, you know temporary things that you're doing, like CI/CD pipeline and so on, uh, running tests, uh, I think uh, that will keep your environment uh, much cleaner. Absolutely, yeah. I think it was a great summer, and yeah, I think this is really the the, the prime use because we also see a lot for um, for for these um, types of environments that you. You have some kind of an automation already that allows you to spin up a stack, right? And then either in your case, it would be sort of the, the real environment, the real AWS. And then um, what we do is basically just spinning up a container and then almost give you uh, an, an empty AWS account that you can then sort of later um, tear down again, right? As, as part of the, the container destruction. But yeah, super powerful content, uh, concept. And I think a lot of it is already about the the engineering rigor behind this, right? Making sure that you actually have these these tests in place, these pipelines, the automation, the re repeatability, and then sort of I would almost say like which environment you use behind the, the scenes is almost a technicality. I think it's really more about the um, yeah having this engineering rigor of, of testing frequently and and on, and on every change essentially. Um, okay, cool. No, that's great. Uh, great discussion. So um, just to um, move on a bit, so the, another service we're quite excited about is EventBridge Pipe. So this is actually something that is uh, more one of the new services. The first version came out with um, 3.1 uh, just a couple of uh, couple of weeks ago, and uh, it's been one of the most upvoted features uh, in our in our feature tracker on on, on GitHub. So um, a lot of users really were excited to get a first version of this. Um, and basically, you, you're probably familiar with the service. Basically, you know, you have event sources that can consist of, um, you know, things like databases, SQS queues, topics, and so on. And then there's some filtering uh, mechanism and enrichment in place. And then you can sort of pump that um, these these data items to targets, like uh, again, a database or uh, something like um, a, a stream where you can then sort of do further processing downstream. Um, so this is something we're very actively building out. So so far we have. Support for um, certain combinations of sources and targets, including SNS, SQS, DynamoDB streams, and others. Um, and we'd really very much love to get get the feedback from the community on, on how that's how that's working, which additional use cases we uh, we can build out there. Um, yeah, have you have you had much um, chance to play with um, EventBridge pipes yet? Uh, yeah, I have. Uh, I put a few things into production uh, with EventBridge pipes, and uh, you know, you removed some of the uh, custom code I had. I had even had this uh, plugin that. Um, uh, creates a, a well, this server thing or plugin that basically can uh, connect, create a lambda function that connects uh, DynamDB stream to um, uh, forgot where it was to, to event bridge. So essentially, I've got uh, something that turns DynamDB event in uh, into um, uh, event bridge event, and so event bridge pipes kind of you now doing that for you. So I was able to just get rid of that whole thing and just replace it with a, a few lines of uh, cloud formation to put in the event bridge pipes instead of this uh, custom. Server thing or we'll plugin, um, awesome. and yeah, uh, yeah and yeah, it's, uh, I can see more things that's been supported by the event bridge pipes. Uh, this uh, right now is uh, it feels like just a, I think a small small set of uh, targets and the sources uh, is is you know is useful. Uh, but then there's also the the whole uh, no code ETL thing they introduce as well at the reinvent uh, the thing that connects, for example, I think DynamDB to Open Search is quite interesting one. That's mm -hmm. again something that a lot of people uh, use, uh, but it's interesting that, that they put that as a separate thing as opposed to turn it into you know just it up as an event bridge pipe. So it's, you know you've got different ways to, to connect different services depending mm -hmm. on what the source and destinations are. Um, I, I guess it's probably because it's worked on by different teams, uh, but it feels a little bit disjointed in that. Okay, yeah. I won't have like one way that connects. You know, that that gives me that gives me no code connection between different kind of you know, event sources uh, and targets. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I, I like event bridge uh, pipes. Uh, it's, uh, it's 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 nice. I, I wish that they have more things like this. Yeah, no, that's a great point. It's it's, it's a very powerful service, and we I mean we we see in our implementation some similarities uh, in the event sources, for example, with Lambda event source mappings. Um, so actually, on the on the code level, we're able to um, unify a couple of these um, source mapping logic um, that is common and, and kind of similar across different services. But totally agree with you that to be um, AWS um, phenomenon, right? That different teams are doing things slightly differently. Um, okay, great. Yeah, definitely looking forward to to getting more more feedback on on uh, on, on pipes as we build this out further with the community. So. Um, if if you want to switch gears a bit, we can we can dive into a couple of demos. Uh, and again, let, let's see how, how far we get. I've, I've prepared two or three, and um, 
I would like to first dive a bit into um, IAM uh, policy screen. Um, so IAM is generally something that we, we've built quite a lot of innovations around because we um, just realized that it's, um, it's a bit of a pain uh, to work with IAM, especially coming from um, a previous version of local stack that did not have IAM enforcement enabled. And you basically just deployed your app into AWS and then suddenly you needed all these permissions and policies. Um, and, you know, things like policies should also be least privileged, right? So there's a whole set of best practices around um, what actually constitutes a well-written policy. Um, in general, what we also discover is that um, it tends to maybe slow developers down a bit if you're working with a new service. Obviously, thinking security in IAM uh, as first principle is important, but you have to make yourself, you familiarize yourself with different resource identity-based policies and so on. And one pretty interesting point is that the enforcement is not always visible or even inspectable from the outside. So a lot of that is, is black box. And I'll, I'll show you in just a second what uh, we mean by that. Um, so we've invested quite heavily into IAM enforcement in general, uh, and specifically also a new feature that we call IAM policy stream, which is, is quite nice. It's, it sort of generates the policies that you require on, on the fly. Um, so I've actually taken a, a, a sample here that um, one of our team members, Daniel, who's been very much actively involved in the development of this, and he also showed um, a, this demo and in the last um, 3.0 release um, community event. Um, and I thought it was a really nice example that showcases the um, functionality here. So let's assume you have an SNS um, topic, right, that's connected to an SQS queue, uh, so fairly common pattern. Um, and so if you basically deploy this into, into a, a real AWS account without um, sort of the required policies, um, then it can, the integration can just fail silently, right? So you, you, you push in, uh, a, a message into the, into the topic and it simply never arrives at the queue um, because um, the, the topic lacks um, the permission to actually forward the item there. And it's something that can be pretty hard to figure out, honestly, because, you know, I think there's maybe some logs in, in CloudTrail where you can, can take a look, um, but there's... It's, it's not always straightforward to, to debug issues like that where um, there is some permission issues that um, basically break some of the integrations. Um, so there's a short sample that we can we can briefly showcase and I'm gonna switch to my terminal here for um, some of these demos. So um, hopefully it's, uh, hopefully you can actually read the font. Is it is it big enough? I think so, right? Yeah, I can see it. Uh, it's a lot of text, though, so uh, you have to maybe walk me through what we're looking at. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Definitely, we'll walk through. Yeah. So one, so basically, um, the way we start um, the IAM enforcement is with this enforce IAM equals one feature flag. So this is basically a configuration that we set in local stack to to start the the IAM engine essentially, um, just to basically start the enforcement. Okay. Um, okay. And you have to do that when you start the uh, local stack. Yes, exactly. So by default, it's actually disabled, um, and um, we're yeah, you can enable it with this feature flag. So you have to basically configure it at startup. Um, okay, so I have this small example here. Let me just switch to my IDE here real quick for um, for this for this short demo. Um, so what we're going to do um, is to um, basically follow these steps here. So we're going to first create a topic, right? Um, an SNS topic with the name test topic. And by the way, so we're using the AWS local command here, which is um, just a drop-in replacement for the AWS CLI that talks to local stack directly. Um, so we've um, we create a queue here. You can actually see the the requests coming coming through, and there's actually already some some IAM policy engine messages that you can see here with the context for this action, uh, with uh, with certain um, properties that attach to the context. Um, we can now subscribe the queue to the topic, right? So just using the SNS subscribe um, command. And um, now basically what we'll do next is we'll, um, we'll, we'll publish a message to, to the topic itself, right? So, and um, you know, uh, obviously as we have the integration, we would expect that um, the message arrives from the SNS in topic in the SQS queue. But what we see here is, is actually an error. We get an access denied error and say, that says, you know, um, this this user in this case is the SNS principal service principal is not authorized to um, to a send message on this resource, right? Mm -hmm. So it gives you fairly um, detailed uh, insights into what is actually missing um, in a particular integration between services. Um, so this this failed. So if we, if we try to get the message from the queue, obviously there would be nothing in there. So it's just going to return an empty result. Um, so nothing's in there. So what we can now do. Uh, is we can uh, basically um, update the IAM policy of that um, uh, of the uh, uh, of the 
key of the queue to to enable access to uh, to an SNS topic to to forward messages there, right? Right. Um, I've already prepared a an attributes uh, JSON here. That's basically just the uh, the policy uh, language, right? So uh, it is uh, effect allow um, for send message on this particular resource under this principle, right? Uh, under the condition. And the principle that... is the SNS servers and condition is that uh, it has to come from that particular queue that we just created. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Hundred percent. Right. This is unfortunately this is a. Uh, the, the JSON is here just uh, encoded as a string, but um, I hope it was able, we were able to, to read that. Um, right, so if we if we then run basically this, this update command, right, so we go back here uh, and I just do a, a set queue attributes um, with this attributes file. Um, now basically the, the policy has been enabled uh, for, for the queue and we can then sort of do another um, publish to the topic and this this time it actually went through, right? So we're not we're not seeing any error messages anymore here, uh, and we can and can receive the message from from the queue itself. Um, right. So this is a uh, sort of simple example where we sh we will see okay, um, you know, having integration between the two services. One service is trying to call another. That's happening more and more frequently as we have more integrations between services. You know, also a lambda function, for example, is trying to access a DynamoDB table or something like that, right? There's a lot of integrations between services. And this explainable IM, as we call it, gives us some really detailed insights into, into what's happening here. Yeah, I think the, 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 sort of, the, the more sort of synchronous aspects uh, of, let's say, like Lambda function talking to DynamDB, those are fairly easy to debug because uh, you get the logs in your Lambda function uh, log group. So you can just you, know, you can see that those are usually quite easy to debug. Uh, but it's more the so asynchronous things that are happening between different services. Um, they don't get the logs for, say, SQS or SNS. Uh, um, uh, you have to enable those. You have to get them delivered to the right place and you know to look for them. And there's a multiple exactly. sort of, you know, ifs that have to be true for you to actually figure out, uh, okay, the problem that I'm looking at the message is, is because uh, uh, my, um, my queue is, uh, is, is, well, my, my, my topic is missing the permission. So this stuff looks uh, really, really interesting, uh, especially for debugging some of this uh, integration between when using services like event bridge pipes, uh, more of the no code solutions that are doing all the, the data transfer, uh, no, ch uh, data sh uh, shuffling for you. Um, I think this is where the permission stuff uh, is going to be much harder to debug uh, without something like this. Yeah. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah, totally. We actually see another example, just in a bit where we have a, a user level error in, in a Lambda. This, as you mentioned, this is going to be a bit more straightforward to, to debug there. But I think it's really interesting for especially these, these inter-service integrations. Um, one thing I wanted to um, mention, because now what we saw is the, um, the IAM enforcement, and I'm basically switching over to our web UI here. And I think I just realized this is the first time in this, in this session that I'm, I'm, I'm showing the, the web app. So this is app.localselected.cloud. Um, I'm logged in here with my profile. And this is really the entry point, uh, the portal into sort of a lot of functionality that we expose uh, through the UI. And we have this one section here is called IAM policy stream. And the, the cool part is here now, um, that as we were running this experiment or this, this, this sample, it was actually showing us uh, the, uh, the policy and the endpoints that were required for this particular um, cause, right? So basically what I, what I added before in the, you know, the predefined JSON that I already had in the, in the attributes file, you could, you could have also just extracted it from here because local stack observed, okay, there's a request being made to SQS um, and you need this uh, particular policy in order to enable this call, right? Um, ah, so okay. Just to sort of close the loop on, on the, this is what we call the IAM policy stream that actually generates policies as you make requests to the, uh, to the system. Okay, so the workflow here is that uh, I will say start the local stack and then I will run my uh, suite of tests. And then at the end of that, some of the tests may fail and I can come here, I can look at the summary policy and see, okay, I am uh, missing some uh, IAM permissions, I'm, mi I'm missing some uh, resource uh, policies, and then I can then turn, turn this, you are use this and then go back to my code um, to figure out, okay, where do I put this resource policy, for example, uh, and, 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 and fix it that way. 100%, yeah, exactly. So in fact, if we just did like a, a very quick restart of local stack here, uh, let me just restart with, and again, I am enforcement enabled, um, create our queue, uh, create our topic, uh, oops, create topic, and then we can actually already see in, in the stream uh, the requests coming through here, right? So local stack is observing what's happening. Uh, and then if I do the, um, uh, the subscribe operation, 
and then the um, this uh, what is it publish um, then we actually see the IAM violation that you actually see right here right so it actually really shows you there was an error in, in this right. call you actually need uh, this particular policy here enabled for your uh, for your scenario so yeah so but totally to your point really sort of an enable for especially for these inter-service integrations where it can sometimes be a bit hard to figure out what's actually going on behind the scenes right in, in really rest cool that's very nice cool um sweet um yeah so this is kind of i am and again we have a lot of um ongoing enhancements there also the way how we integrate it into things like uh infrastructures code frameworks like terraform for example and there's a whole bunch of work that we're doing to make it even more seamless and uh, and expose it there uh cool so i guess um since uh, time is always uh, short uh, let's switch maybe to to next demo um which would be around chaos engineering right so we briefly touched upon this already uh, and here we're really focusing on, on the technical aspects of this. And more specifically, let's assume you have a, a simple, um, you know, serverless app like this one here, where you have an API gateway, uh, maybe some uh, some Lambda functions, and then a DynamoDB table, um, fairly simple setup. And then, uh, as you well know, in DynamoDB, you get certain um, sort of errors that can happen on the API layer, things like um, rate limiting, right? So um, um, provision throughput exception, provision throughput exceeded exception, um, or sometimes there might even be like errors, just internal server, server errors in the in the service itself, right? That's not something that's happening very frequently, um, but there can be certain error conditions uh, in uh, on your table that the client needs to be aware of. And then one way to handle this, for example, is to, to provide resiliency in the application where, you know, the handler would, would maybe catch uh, any exceptions, put them into, uh, into a topic in a queue, and then sort of later on a downstream asynchronous lambda would pick those up and just do some, um, some retries on the inserts, right? For example, on the put operations. Um, so this is something, and again, having a way to, um, to test this is something that can be really beneficial. Um, and, and that's why one of the features that we're providing here is a way to, to simulate um, outages, errors, and, and also latency conditions. So I want to briefly showcase this. And by the way, a lot of these the samples that I'm showing here are actually available in our, um, let me just quickly go to our docs.localstack.cloud. So that's a great reference for anything you'd like to um, explore, especially, for example, if you look for uh, chaos engineering here, um, then we have, um, I think here in default injection simulated experiments, you'll actually find the, a link to a sample application repository. And this basically showcases uh, the example I want to uh, quickly run through now. So you can see the same type of uh, architecture figure here. And usually they are easy to set up something like a CDK uh, or, or a Terraform configuration. And we can just briefly run through this, um, this example here now. Um, so let me just restart Locustack here. This time I'll, I'll just start it without um, AI enforcement, just basically default, default setup. And uh, in this terminal here on the right hand side, um, I have a small script prepared that will actually walk us through uh, the creation of, um, of this particular sample app that we just saw. Let's take a look at that here. Um, I have this in my um, FIS experiments um, in its resources. So that's the script we're going to run now. I'll just let that run in the background. Um, in it, oops, resources. Uh, and basically what it does is, um, you know, it creates all these resources, right? The DynamoDB table, um, the lambdas, um, there's, well, one of them is called the get product lambda. Um, that is a, uh, an API gateway. And we're getting the, um, the resources for, for the API gateway, um, put the methods in there, um, do some operations on, on updating just some query screen modifications. So a lot of these are just manual steps um, with the AWS CLI that we're, we're running here. Could also be a Terraform or some different script. But in this case, we just, um, for simplicity, pr uh, provided this with uh, AWS commands. Um, all right, so this is um, now deployed here in the, in, in, the back end, in the background. And what we can now do is, um, so, Basically, we can now make a request to this um, to the API gateway, which you know serves the request via Lambda function. But let's now enable the the, the chaos mode, right? So we want to um, inject errors into our um, DynamoDB service and then see how the application actually reacts to that. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'll go to chaos engineering. So this is a whole um, section in in our web UI. It's also accessible programmatically, so you can either do it through the UI or um, or via some, some API calls. 
And I'm going to scroll down here and go to this DynamoDB error section, and we can um, specify a fault probability here. I'm just going to say 100%. Um, so all the requests to DynamoDB are basically now going to going to fail. Uh, and what I'll do now is um, I think I have this somewhere in my um, uh, history here. We can do a request. What is it going to fail with? Uh, good point. So in, the, in in this particular case, it's going to fail with a. Um, uh, Provision throughput exceeded exception. So this is basically the um, that the read or write throughput has, has basically been exceeded. So we're right. we're simulating a, a situation of high load on 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 the, on on the DynamoDB table, which then refuses any additional API calls, and you have to wait a couple of seconds or minutes to to run the request again. Okay, good. Because this is uh, this is one of the things that I find very difficult to actually test. Uh, and there's one of the things that uh, I normally have to use uh, mocks just because uh, uh, with my uh, with my remote code and end-to-end -end tests, uh, I can't reliably make it uh, throw this particular error. And so I end up having to rely on using mocks to test my code against uh, this particular use case. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so this is definitely something that I think it's it's pretty like, and, and these errors really do happen, right? So here we're not talking about some obscure problem that might occur once in a while, like the, the, these provision throughput exceptions, depending on how your table is set up, they, they do actually happen at, at, at runtime. So you really need to, I mean, there is some retries uh, enabled in the SDK and we'll actually see this in just a second. Um, so let me just run this curl command here, which basically um, just runs against this execute API, which is the API gateway endpoint, um, some some payload uh, to add this right. um, to, to the database. Um, and so this is the, just the, the Lambda code starts in the background is now creating the, the task container, the Lambda is running, and we can actually see now provision throughput exceptions coming through, right? So let me just scroll up here again in the logs. Um, we saw, search for it here, provision, provision throughput exception. Yeah, so, and okay. the SDK is actually performing some retries under the covers, um, a certain amount, so I think, three or four retries, and then it basically gives up and raises the, the error back to, to the Lambda runtime. Um, and in this case, we actually had in our Lambda a try catch, which then handles this error and puts the message to, to SQS, right, for, for data processing. Right, and is this a, a, a JavaScript or is this Python? Uh, no, this so this is actually written in uh, in uh, Java itself. Um, oh, okay, I oh, know, so... I see the, 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 the Lambda function that you were running. Exactly. So, so the Lambda function okay. that we're running Java. here okay. is actually written in, in Java. Uh, and we see here is doing a, a put item request, right? And then we are catching DynamoDB exceptions. The, the one that we saw is a subclass mm -hmm. of this. Uh, and then it's basically saying um, message sent to queue, right? Basically, it's, it's just publishing the, the message to, to a dead data queue or like this, this, uh, this queue that picks him up from there. Right. Okay. And uh, in, your, uh, in your local simulator, you're also uh, enforcing the Lambda timeout setting? Uh, yeah. So we, we have a, a timeout. That's actually a great point. So the, um, if we go to init resources here, they have a... Uh, a timeout value defined. So okay. in this case, we just set 45 seconds. Um, can also be, I think the other one had 20 seconds. Yeah, so we have full full emulation of the of the timeouts as well. Okay, that's cool. Because uh, the, one of the things that the, often this uh, this kind of provisions throughput the exception doesn't often well doesn't always manifest in the actual error in your lambda function because like I said, SDK has got retry, uh, but it will often uh, manifest certainly in JavaScript is that uh, the JavaScript SDK has got I think a default of ten retries uh, with uh, exponential back off in between. So you mm. often get a timeout instead of an actual uh, Lambda function error because of DynamDB super exceptions. You also you, you, instead of manifest into like a timeout uh, for your function instead mm. until you look into the uh, look into say the X-ray trace or something like that and see that you're making multiple calls to DynamDB yeah. and it's uh, and it keeps failing. So this is something that uh, I guess that, that can help you catch that. Uh, yeah. easier because you're going to see your function timeout, but then you're going to see in your uh, local stack logs that, oh, there's like a bunch of uh, triple exceeded uh, exceptions uh, in the logs as you were, once your function was retrying. Yeah, exactly. And depending on how the function is configured, so for example, if it has an event source mapping, uh, if the Lambda fails, the it would actually get re respawned with the same event, right? So there's some, some built-in error handling mechanisms that would kick in both 
if the error is propagated or if it times out, right? So, um, but yeah, there's definitely, and this I think really showcases like how important it is to um, to test these different scenarios and use cases um, in, 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 in for, for real world applications. So right. now let me quickly switch back to the, um, just to close the loop. Uh, I'll, I'll go to our DynamoDB resource browser and just to quickly show, I think this is also the first time that we show our resource browser, which has all the different services here. Um, and for example, DynamoDB is one of them, right? So we can just go here and we now see um, the table that was created uh, locally. By the way, um, this web application is, is a hosted app, but it's actually connecting to my local instance on localhost. So no outbound connectivity to a cloud system. And we right. see here the products table um, and I cannot just go here and, uh, and do a, uh, a scan on it. So if I just go to items and do a scan, um, it's basically it's basically empty right now, and what we can now do is, um, as this is still running, we're going to stop the experiment. Um, basically, go back to zero fault probability. Update this here, uh, and by the way, this was actually also retrying right because it was it wasn't uh, still uh, okay a because it error. was failing as well. <laughs> but, but but now the now the request was coming through, and the reason why is because the the SQS had uh, an event source mapping that was continued. If you go back to our architecture diagram, this was continuously being uh, respawned, this lambda, and trying to add the item. And once we lifted um, the, the the error, it actually went through, and now the, the update has happened eventually, right? So again, so this kind of nicely showcases how you can create these resilient applications and, and also test them end-to-end -end, uh, in, in, your, in your local environment there. That's very cool. That's very cool. Um, and I also saw you had the, some simulation for latency and a few other things as well, besides the throughput error. Yes, absolutely. So there is uh, the same basically goes for Kinesis, for example. Yes, okay. You can latency. add latencies um, to this. Again, this is like this. Um, this to uh, specific services error. or to everything? I mean, in this particular case, it's, it's, it's for, for everything. Okay. Um, we also have some more fine grade control, but in the UI, not everything is exposed. Um, and, and then there's also things where, for example, you can say uh, an entire region goes down, right? You can say US East right. 1 or, or US West 2 goes down, and you can simulate those as well. Or um, if your whole service goes down. Yeah, exactly. Okay. The whole, like literally the whole AWS API control plane goes down, right? The, the entire service. Okay. Um, yeah, now that's something that we, um, we're definitely quite excited about, especially if you think about the um, some of the testing implications of this. There's a few more examples, for example, on, on this slide here, um, we also applied this to several other services. For example, in RDS, we have a way to do global cluster failover or in Route 53, we actually added support for um, DNS-based failover. So you can actually have a, if a client makes a request, let's assume you have a, a replicated service that sits in two regions, right? A US East 1 and, and um, US Central 1, for example, and you have a Route 53 in front of that. Um, we can actually do health checks on these on these endpoints, and if one of them goes down, there's like a failover to to a, a secondary, right? So um, again, a lot of these more advanced use cases that um, you would certainly see a lot in in production environments, and we also try to enable ways to test these uh, these failover scenarios in, uh, in in the stack um, and make them part of your of your CI testing as well. Um, okay. Cool. So um, I guess maybe if we have a couple of minutes, the, the last one I wanted to briefly show is um, around local stack cloud sandboxes, um, okay. which basically is the this ephemeral instance that we briefly touched upon before. Again, that's something we uh, put out as a, um, a, a preview and alpha version actually in in um, V3, and um, so. Essentially, the, the idea is that we spin up these, these temporary hosted instances. We already talked about this briefly before. And then uh, you can quickly deploy and test your changes, for example, in a, in a CI build, right? So let's assume you have some GitHub um, uh, workflow here where somebody creates a pull request. Um, and I'm sure that maybe some of your um, listeners have seen this in, in other repositories where you then get to get a comment on the PR where you can then click, this is the preview that's now available for an hour or so, right? And you can actually look into like preview especially for UI changes, it's quite quite uh, relevant and significant, right? So being able to preview these, these changes. Um, yeah, the way we, we have this enabled, it is also accessible directly from, from the UI or, or from, a, from a CLI endpoint, uh, API endpoint. But I just want to briefly showcase what this looks like in, in the web UI. So I can go here to our uh, local stack instances tab. 
Uh, and there's this additional tab here uh, that says ephemeral um, instances. Um, and actually still had an old one running here. I'm just gonna terminate this here real quick. Start with a, with a fresh state. Um, so now we can say, I wanna um, create an ephemeral instance, right? Let's just call it test one, two, three. And um, what this does now basically in the background, it spins up a, uh, a, a VM, a very lightweight VM that starts a Docker container that has local state running in it. And you get this endpoint URL here, which is now basically almost like a, an AWS um, account that you can use um, in your in, in, in all your um, tooling, right? So we can now see here um, AWS uh, endpoint URL, oops, URL plus this. And then I'll just do an AWS local S3 LS. Before I do this, I'll actually terminate the local stack instance here to make sure that um, nothing's running locally anymore. So we really see that these requests are going out to the remote instance. Um, and then initially there's nothing in there, but we can create a bucket, right? S3 test one, two, three. Um, and you just have like the full power of the local stack instance that's running in a remote environment, um, giving you a way to test, for example, we could have deployed the application we just saw before entirely just against this um, this uh, ephemeral instance that's now running in uh, in this environment. Um, so again, not something we we're sort of um, experimenting with and getting getting some feedback. I guess one of the key benefits to from this, as opposed to maybe you know using some of the approaches with tearing down cloud formation uh, stacks or, or or you know cleaning up the resources is. Cleanup of resource in our case is just remove the instance from here, right? Um, and then obviously the container is, is gone and everything else as well. So I think, especially from a from a resource cleanup point of view and life cycle, this this can uh, simplify things uh, in, in some cases quite a bit. Yeah, I don't um, know if uh, that's a good argument because uh, I mean, for me, just one command, uh, MP, you know, MP serverless, uh, I did remove. Uh, but I can see the more uh, the argument for using this more in that you have a shared environment with your teammates where you want to do some of the testing. Um, we talked about like I guess this inf uh, this ephemeral environment supports some of the tooling around uh, you know the controlling the the chaos experiments and also supports the IAM policy enforcer. Is that right? Absolutely, 100%. Okay. So essentially everything you see in here uh, can also be accessed. So basically the whole UI has this context and you have this context of this of this uh, sandbox instance right now. And then we um, we can just go to this free browser and we see what we just created before, right? So you have the same functionality. You can use cloud right. pods against this instance. You can do uh, the chaos engineering, all the same functionality basically that's exposed here. Okay, okay. So I think uh, that's probably more of a... Um... The, the argument that would uh, make more sense to me than the, oh this is simpler than using the cloud, especially you know if it's just a case of a uh, clicking a button to delete a cloud formation stack. Um, but what you offer is some additional capabilities that you don't get out of the box with AWS. Um, so I think that's probably more the, the thing that I will you know, th that would make more sense to me to use uh, your um, your ephemeral environment as opposed to uh, you know, just using another cloud formation stack. Yeah. Yeah, no, actually, that's a great observation for sure, um, 100%. Um, yeah, no, great. Um, so the, the last thing, if we have one or two more minutes, yeah, um, sure. just really briefly touching upon, because it's something that we're quite excited about, is uh, a sneak preview into our new local stack uh, Snowflake emulator. So um, one of the, so what, first of all, what is Snowflake? Uh, Snowflake is a, is a cloud data platform. Um, so here we're now stepping out of the, the AWS world, which is our still our primary target, but Snowflake is its own ecosystem, right? It's, it's a data platform that allows you to upload files, um, run SQL statements to create tables, databases, views, and so on. Uh, you can select uh, data from, from your tables, um, run scheduled jobs to create EPL pipelines and so on. So it's, uh, it's a fairly active um, ecosystem of, of just data tooling. Um, and it turns out that there is also a need for, um, you know, first of all, testing and, and also a need for some something like a local localized version of, of, of the dev experience. Um, so what we put out or we, we set out to a, uh, a journey and an adventure to actually start building a first version of a, of a Snowflake emulator that allows you to run data pipelines on the local machine. And, um, it, you know, the nice thing about what we've built here is it, uh, it, it works on the API level, right? So we basically emulate the Snowflake API. So we get a lot of these integrations for free and out of the box. So things like a JDBC driver, or if you have your database visualization tool, you can just use that um, 
you know, with the native connectivity uh, against against this um, against this emulator. So I just want to very briefly show what this looks like. Um, I can briefly spin it up here. It shouldn't take uh, shouldn't take us a minute. Um, so this is actually a um, using the local stack extension mechanism. So it's more of a technicality, but we basically built Snowflake as an extension that can be installed into the local stack container. And I've done it here now. It's basically up and running. If I do a Docker PS, you actually see uh, the local stack Snowflake image running here. And then I can move over to or switch over to my uh, database visualization tool. So in this case, I'm using dbeaver, uh, which is one of these uh, popular tools. Um, and I can go to the connection settings here. And what you'll see is we basically connect to snowflake.localhost.cloud, which is our well-known local local endpoint with some test uh, connection settings, right? Um, and we can now basically just step through these commands. And you can see here on the left-hand side in the background, there's um, a bunch of um, processing happening. So I'm just creating a table. Um, we're inserting some, some Bob and Alice into the table. Uh, we're doing a select and we actually get the results back here. And then we have even things like a um, support for UDFs, for user-defined functions, where you can create a, a JavaScript UDF, for example, that um, returns hello world, and we just do a select in this, um, and it actually executes the JavaScript um, behind the scenes with the input that you provide to it. Um, so this is really more of a, just a first teaser, but we're um, quite excited and, and you know working with a couple of um, beta uh, early adopters, beta beta users, beta customers who are who are evaluating this first version of this, and we definitely love to uh, to get some feedback from the community and, and get some some uh, some support from early adopters. So if anyone's out there using Snowflake and you would like to do some some testing or some local execution, then please please let us know. Um, yeah, that looks uh, very cool. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, okay, like I said, uh, it totally makes a lot of sense for you to do this. Uh, uh, and uh, I, have, I haven't done Snowflake myself, but I do know that in the past, uh, I think I've had issues with clients because of this, the number of seats they have on their Snowflake account or something like that. So it wasn't easy to uh, get access to the, the, the Snowflake environment uh, for development. And so having this would actually be quite useful at that time as well. Yeah. Absolutely, not. It's really, really good feedback. So, certainly looking forward. And there is some some similarities to some other um, big data services in, in AWS, which we also spend some some time and effort in, which we also support Athena, Redshift, and so on. So we definitely see an increasing need also in this in this data space to to provide some support. Right, um, gotcha. Okay, so just wrapping up. I mean, what's next? We're definitely um, focusing a lot on on building out the platform, right? So. Both the emulator with um, you know increasing the parity of all the services that we provide, adding new services like event rich pipes, for example, but also looking at the end-to-end -end dev lifecycle with things like the ephemeral instance that we saw and you know some of the um, analytics and the CI um, insights. We didn't have a chance to look into those today, but certainly it's sort of more and more focus on on the end-to-end -end platform functionality to really support development and testing workflows end-to-end -end, uh, for for cloud development. Um, doubling down on extensions as well. So briefly mentioned that this plugin mechanism that allows us to, um, to plug in new functionality into local stack. We did already uh, receive some community contributions, which is quite exciting. There's uh, an extension called Authress. It's an, an IAM um, uh, um, policy enforcement uh, system and that has been contributed as an extension. Uh, and also, as mentioned, uh, the Snowflake emulators uh, and other things. So yeah, so definitely quite, quite exciting um, um, months and, 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 and years ahead. Big, big plans for this year, and I hope we're going to have many more uh, opportunities to catch up and in, in, in your in your podcast and in your show. Yeah, likewise. Uh, this definitely has uh, it looks it looks amazing. Uh, it looks very really exciting. And I saw you put out a, a was it, maybe it was you or someone else uh, um, uh, put out a, something that you're looking for a developer advocate for your team. Uh, you see if someone is listening and looking for you know join, looking to join your team, uh, where do they go? Absolutely, 100%. That, that's awesome. Thanks so much for, for sharing that. So on our website, localstack.cloud, we have our careers page, uh, careers. And we actually currently have quite a few openings. And as you mentioned, for example, the, um, uh, the Debra lead that we're looking for, but also several engineering roles um, that we're looking for, customer success managers and so on. So please do reach out anytime. You'll find us uh, in on the careers page uh, on our Slack channel, which is um, the best way to get in touch with our community as well, uh, or also via LinkedIn and, and email as well. Okay, perfect. 
thank you so much for coming in and uh, showing us uh, what's been uh, happening with, uh, with uh, the local stat version three. Um, can't remember. Well, can't can't imagine how much work you guys put in for to push this much stuff out in the, in about six months. So um, you know, good job. <laughs> Big, big kudos to the team, especially. I mean, I'm, I'm, I have the pleasure to to showcase what you know what the team has been putting out there. But it's it's an, a huge, immense team effort. So it's big, big kudos to the team and everybody in the, in the community as well who's contributing to this to this big effort. Yeah, best of luck, and uh, hopefully I'll see you maybe uh, reinvent this year. Looking forward to it. Take it easy. Again. And uh, thanks for listening, everyone. And I uh, hope we we'll see you guys next time. Okay, bye bye. Um, ciao.